Hello and welcome to this Debt Recovery Masterclass with me, Fiona McKenzie, Marketing Manager with McRoberts and Eulen Kyle, and Stephen Cowan, Managing Director of Eulen Kyle. Today I'm going to be asking Stephen some questions to pin down how you can best enforce judgments made against your debtors to ensure you're paid what you're owed. So Stephen, perhaps I could ask you first to talk a little bit about the judgment that will be made in the first place that can then be enforced. Well, thanks, uh, Fiona. Um, I think the first thing that's worthwhile uh, stating is the length of time that it takes uh, to get to judgment. Well, we've actually got two names for that in Scotland. If the debt's less than £5,000, it's called a decision. If the debt's more than £5,000, it's called a decree. But the emphasis has to be on the length of time it takes to get this piece of paper in effect. <laughs> yeah. And that is going to really be a minimum, I would say, for debts um, less than £5,000, it's going to take a minimum of two months. And for debts um, more than £5,000, it's going to probably take about uh, four to six weeks. Now, really what you have at that stage is a piece of paper which we are going to pass to sheriff officers uh, to enforce. Mm -hmm. So that really is a very brief answer to your first question, Fiona. Um, that's really the process. I'm not going to bore you with uh, all the details as to how you get that piece of paper. Uh, that can take a two or three week course in itself which I'm sure you really don't want uh, to be favoured with. <laughs> okay, thanks Stephen. Um, so what, what are the main options available to, to enforce this um, de decree? Okay, this is a very easy question you've asked, but the answer is not so simple. Uh -huh. um, first of all, it depends on focusing um, on the type of data. Is it a consumer debtor or is it a commercial debtor? And the options are very different depending on the nature of the debtor. Putting it at its broadest, what a decree allows you to do is to attach it, that is the decree, to the debtor's movable property and convert that judgment into cash. Mm. And it really is the process of going through the enforcement route that will lead to success or otherwise. So essentially there are various different steps that can be taken. The generic term for judgment enforcement in Scotland is diligence. And nobody really knows the reason why it's called diligence. Perhaps that is what a diligent creditor would do if they want to enforce a debt. Uh, but I'll tend to use the, uh, the expression judgment enforcement because I think it's more 21st century <laughs> rather than yeah. going back uh, to pre, when I say prehistoric times, I'm actually I'm talking about maybe the 18th, 19th century uh, where you can actually find the origins, uh, origins of Scottish judgment enforcement. But basically, um, the steps are sheriff officers are instructed to carry out what we call a charge for payment. That's the first stage of enforcement, mm -hmm. allowing the debtor uh, 14 days to pay the debt. And thereafter, the sheriff officer um, can enter the debtor's premises. And I'm really focusing in on a commercial debt here, value the debtor's goods uh, for sale and thereafter, the goods can be removed for auction and sale. Um, when it comes to a consumer debtor, um, these goods uh, will be in the debtor's house, and the process of attaching and selling these goods cannot uh, be carried out unless the creditor makes an application to the court to sell those goods which are attached. And the sheriff, that is the judge in the sheriff court, will only grant an order 
to sell the attached goods in exceptional circumstances. Mm -hmm. And there are a significant number of hurdles that a creditor has to traverse before a sheriff will grant an exceptional attachment order. And even if he does, then there uh, are a whole host of items which are exempt from sale. The best way to look at it is, in fact, there's only available for sale luxury items um, in a, a house. Okay. So the net result of that is that when it comes to a consumer debtor, um, attachment and sale practically, and from my perspective, is not really going to be um, an option. There are other uh, remedies which we can take, um, and I'm happy to explore the if you'd like me to, Fiona. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be great, Stephen. Yeah. No, yeah, please do. Please do. Okay. Thank you. So when it comes to, uh, let's look at a consumer debtor, first of all, because that's mm -hmm. where I've been most pessimistic. Um, most consumers uh, are employed. Yeah. Well, you'd hope to be employed. And that's really the type of debtor that we would take a court action mm -hmm. um, against. Perhaps I should have said at the outset, um, that enforcement is only really going to be worthwhile if the debtor's got the ability to pay the debt. Yeah, and that yeah. really is just the bottom line. And mm -hmm. what I'm saying is the result of a significant amount of experience in, in this game, if I could put it that way. Um, if a debtor cannot pay the debt, then it's going to be extremely difficult to get payment. So the process actually is very good if you're dealing with slow payers. Mm -hmm. um, and I would commend it to you. Um, so focusing on a consumer debtor, the best way uh, to get paid is what we call earnings arrestment. And the process is very simple. The, we would have to be aware of the client's employment details. We might be able to get that information from the client, the debtor may volunteer it, or we might be able to get it from a tracing agent. And thereafter, we instruct the sheriff officers to carry out a charge for payment. There must be a charge for payment as a precursor to an earnings arrestment. Then 14 days after the charge for payment, we instruct sheriff officers to arrest the debtor's salary. Yeah. And the effect of the arrestment, and this is all governed by statute, the effect of the arrestment is that the employer is obliged to pay a proportion of the debtor's salary to the um, arresting creditor. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does take some time for the debt to be repaid. It is the least intrusive type of enforcement that's taken yeah. against a debtor. And if it works, uh, it's very successful and I would commend it to you. Um, dealing with a business debtor, again, we start with the charge for payment. Uh, we are able to arrest or freeze the debtor's bank account. And that's best achieved if we have the debtor's bank account details. Actually, you don't need to carry out the charge for payment if you're carrying out uh, a bank arrestment. Mm -hmm. um, we are also able actually to use bank arrestment uh, in respect of an individual as well. Um, so bank arrestment is a effective uh, remedy, but it's only effective if the debtor's uh, bank account is in credit. You can't arrest an overdraft. Yeah. Um, yeah. If the debtor owns what we call in Scotland heritable property. In England, we call it freehold property. But best explained, heritable property would be a house. Um, we're able to ascertain if the debtor owns their property by carrying out a property search. Um, and we're able thereafter to proceed with what's called an inhibition. And the effect of an inhibition very broadly is that the debtor cannot sell their house or remortgage their house until they clear the debt that's due to the inhibiting creditor. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to proceed with an attachment of the debtor's goods in a commercial debt 
and attach the goods and sell the, the, the goods that are attached. And I think I alluded to that already, yes. uh, but I'm focusing on, on consumer debt here. And what I would say is that whilst we can do that, it's the actual process of attaching and selling the goods rather than removing the goods that acts as a spur to payment. It's the process of attend the sheriff officer mm. uh, attending the debtor's premises. And I don't like using the word threat, but I can't really think of another word. It, it, it really is the threat of removing these goods yeah. that the, the, the debtor will be reluctant to have them removed and will enter into an arrangement for the debtor to be paid or the creditor rather to be paid uh, rather than the goods removal taking place. Yes. Gosh, yes. So, so quite quite a lot of options that, that can be used. And I guess, as, as you're saying, it depends on, you know, whether it's a commercial debtor, or a consumer debtor, and you have to use your judgment on, on when to use each option um, as, as, as professionals, we, we do that at Yul and Kyle to, to help people to, to decide which option, I, I, I guess. Is, is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. And the way that I would look at this is you have to look at the entire debt recovery process. Mm. But, and I know we've covered this before in a previous presentation, but you really are starting off with a letter before action. Yes. And a certain number of debtors are going to respond to the letter before action. Thereafter, if there's no response and we take court action, slow paying debtors will generally respond once they receive the service copy court document that that should normally bring them to the table. And then we're moving further down the, the recovery process on the assumption that the debtor does not respond to the service copy court document, then we're getting decree. And what I've explained to you is, is traversing through the various enforcement options. Yeah. Not all of them you have to take and you can pick which is the most effective. Mm -hmm. But the first one is the charge for payment. And that generally is the cheapest option uh, yeah. that you're taking. And, that, and whilst the sheriff officer's fees are the debtor's responsibility, the creditor really will have to reimburse these in the event of settlement not being forthcoming. So generally, a charge for payment is going to be within £100, which isn't a huge amount. Of course, yeah. it depends on the level of the debt. But clients or creditors should remember that the sheriff officers are our eyes and ears. This is the first time that we might have any indication as to the debtor's uh, ability to pay the debt. So if the sheriff officer were to come back to us um, after they have carried out the charge for payment, let's assume it's a business debt, and they come back and they say the debtor company is in the, in the course of closing down or the debtor company, they've got business premises, but it's in a dilapidated state and the chances of recovery are very poor, then really, obviously, we're going to report that back to the client. But it's at that stage, really, that the client really would have to make a decision, I would suggest, to write off the debt. Mm -hmm. um, if the sheriff officer comes back with a more optimistic report, then other uh, enforcement options really are open to the creditor. Practically, they'll be open to the creditor. So if the sheriff officer were to come back and say, oh, we've been round to the debtor's premises and they've got a significant number of assets, which if they were sold would realize the debt, that opens a whole host of options. We could consider attachment or if it's a debt, perhaps our, the value of the debt is around 5,000 pounds. For sake of argument, I'm just giving that as an example. I would suggest to the client they may want to consider uh, an insolvency option, um, either liquidation for a limited company or bankruptcy for a partnership or sole trader, because, because that can often be quicker and more effective mm -hmm. than the route of attachment and sale. Mm -hmm. So so really, um, people should come, should come to you and ask as soon as possible, you know, what perhaps what the best course of action would be in their particular situation. Is is that right? Or how, yes, how I mean, can you and Kyle best help? 
Okay, how can you loan Kyle Bez help? Well, let's just make, take a scenario. A yeah. client phones up or emails saying they've got a debt of around £10,000 they're very concerned about its collectability. What do you recommend? The first thing I would do is establish the de debtor's ability to pay. So I would ask some questions of the client. Have you been in touch recently? What have you done to try to recover the debt? And from that, you're gauging um, the recoverability immediately. If the, the client were to say, yeah, as far as I'm aware, they're still trading, um, that would indicate that court action could be successful. The alternative could be when we spoke to them, they said they were going into liquidation or going into administration, then you're facing another situation that possibly that's going to be a debt write-off. Mm -hmm. um, the client, of course, may say, I've got no idea. Um, they answer the phone, but I get absolutely nowhere with them. So what can we do in that situation? Um, we can go to an external firm of insolvency practitioners and asking them to um, profile the debtor and see if they've got any information about the debtor. If what they will do is review the latest accounts, um, they also might have heard in the grapevine if there are issues happening with that data. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a very good indication as to what steps we can take. We actually have got an online facility called the Scottish Judgment Centre, and it's on our website. If that's mm -hmm. completed, uh, then we just forward that to um, our insolvency practitioners. Yeah. And invariably, they get back to us within 48 hours. I mean, I could say that they get back to us within 24 hours, hours which actually has always been the experience which is very very quick but just in case um, there's some slippage I would say that we'll get back to you within 48 hours which is fast. The other thing we can do is we can uh, instruct our sheriff officers to make a, a pre-sue um, visit and they're able to go out to the premises and establish uh, the extent to which they think the debtor is able to pay the debt and that is money well spent that should be contained within a hundred pounds as well mm -hmm. and if you consider even the disbursements involved in raising a court action they often will be greater than the cost of a pre-sue visit the difference is that the cost of a pre-sue visit will not be recoverable from the debtor but i i would commend that to you Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, so before we go today, do you have any final advice you'd like to, to offer people watching this? Yes, I think my advice would be always to act sooner rather than later. The longer you leave a debt, the more difficult it is going to be to collect. Mm. Um, the other piece of advice I would give is, and I know it's a bit of an imponderable just now, but there are quite a lot of restrictions in place just now as a result of COVID um, and changes to insolvency legislation which to an extent are limiting options which a creditor may have uh, in the event of a debtor's insolvency. For example, one is called reservation of title um, and that's a situation where the goods actually don't belong to the debtor until they're paid for. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with a limited company, um, the right to actually physically go in and recover these goods have been um, curtailed somewhat by a recent piece of legislation, which I'm happy to talk about in another video or another recording, <laughs> which I'm sure you. that those that are watching will be happy to, to look at. But but these would but um, in a nutshell, act sooner rather than later. Don't let it fester. Thanks, Stephen. That's excellent. Pleasure. So, excellent. Thank you. Um, so that's it for for this video. But if you have any further questions for Stephen on this topic or other debt related. Uh, themes, please do contact him directly. His details will appear on the screen shortly and he'll try to help you as best as he can. So in the meantime, thank you very much for watching and we hope you can attend another Yule and Kyle masterclass soon.